Welcome, everyone. I haven't even said anything yet. Wait until after the panel to decide if we deserve some applause. All right. Um, look, I'm, uh, I'm super excited to welcome everyone uh, to the startup stage, also here in sunny Tel Aviv for the AWS Summit 2023. Um, is this being recorded? Okay, I'll say it anyway. It's my favorite AWS Summit. I hope the rest of my team doesn't see this. Um, my name is, uh, is Kellen O'Connor. Um, I have the humble pleasure to, to lead our startups team for AWS across the Europe, Middle East, and Africa region. Um, and our startups team, in a nutshell, um, we are the feet on the street that's out there to help identify and support um, all of you, um, the entrepreneurs and startups in your support of bold ambitions, um, defining new markets, disrupting industries, and scaling globally. Um, and, uh, and as such, you know, Israel holds a special place um, in all of our hearts, certainly in mine. Um, you know, the startup nation, now the scale up nation. Uh, you may have heard earlier from uh, Howard, um, our global leader in the last session, that, you know, 10% of global unicorns come from Israel, um, which I did the math right before this. I think you've got about 0.1% of the global population. So you're batting at about 100x um, impact on that, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and by the way, and super important ingredient in that is also the investors behind those startups. So a little teaser that one of the later sessions we'll have today, we've actually got the high powered top tier investors behind many of those unicorn successes that'll be up here on stage sharing some insights. So definitely don't miss that one. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about efficient growth. Um, it's a buzzword that's out there a lot these days. What does it mean? You know, some quick background um, for those of you who haven't been following the news over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, there are some things happening in the global economy. Um, there was inflation coming on the back of a lot of the pandemic stimulus that affected central banks taking actions to rise interest rates. That then had knock-on impacts to public tech stock valuations, also private valuations, and ultimately the willingness of VCs to invest and startups to be able to raise capital. And it introduced a new paradigm where instead of you know, growth at all costs, um, venture capitalists and you know, startup CEOs and their boards were really starting to have much more nuanced conversations about what's your path to profitability? What are your core unit economics? How are you achieving growth in a sustainable way that shows that you actually have a business model that's gonna work in the long term, not only when you're able to raise venture capital? And so that's changing the game um, for entrepreneurs. Uh, and it's also making us ask some questions. Well, what does that mean? What are the right trade-offs there? You know, um, is the era of growth over? Okay, I think we all know the WeWork model is probably not the one to pursue, but how do you balance these things? It's a really tough question, and so to help answer that for all of you, we have three fabulous founders and co-founders here. I'll let them introduce their themselves to share some of the different ways they're approaching this and have navigated it in their own startup journeys. So. Maybe we can start here with you, and uh, I won't steal any more thunder. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Wonderful to see such like a packed room with a lot of familiar faces, by the way. Uh, my name is Noam Schwartz. I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called Active Fence. Active Fence is a 300-people company, uh, about $100 million in funding from uh, Northwest, Charles River, Go Ventures, uh, Resolute, and, uh, and Vintage. And we're in a business called Trust and Safety. We're helping companies, mostly those that create a lot of digital products, so social network, file hosting services, cloud providers, um, and, and gaming, and, and many companies around that spot with a lot of content, and we help them protect their users from abusive behavior and online harms. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Dick Security. Dick Security is a cloud data security company. And we help organizations, first off, discover what data they own across our AWS and Azure and GCP and Snowflake environments. We help them classify that information, whether we have PII or PHI or PCI. So we help them visualize data risk or data compliance or data privacy issues. And then, of course, we help them protect that data in real time. 
how do we identify if an employee is stealing data? Or how do we identify if we got compromised and our data is being leaked out? We're a team of approximately 60 today, uh, about 45 in Israel, 15 in the States. I think we're probably the youngest one in the panel here. We're <laughs> 20 months old. Uh, we raised almost $50 million. Uh, teammate was our first investor, and then Signalfire and Felicis and multiple CVCs. Actually, we can actually have a whole session about CVCs as well. Um, <laughs> happy to be here. Hi, I'm Jonathan. I'm uh, the co-founder and CEO of uh, Riverside.fm. We are in an uh, online recording studio in the browser, and you're wondering, what does that mean? So I think um, when you look today at companies and creators, everybody's looking to record remotely online, right? Conferences, customer testimonials, corporate podcasts, learning and development. And what people used to do is they would go on Zoom, Teams, um, and they would try to record something, it would be terrible quality, really hard to edit afterwards. So basically, we took that experience, put it in the browser, it's super high quality and very easy to edit. Today, we're used by tens of thousands of customers around the world. Some people are AWS, Amazon, New York Times, Spotify, probably your favorite podcaster is using Riverside. Um, from the Netherlands originally were three brothers who made Aliyah. Uh, yeah, very happy to be here. Great, so as you can see, we've got some, some really interesting stories uh, and companies that we're gonna dig deeper on. I think we'll, we'll start with you, Noam. So Act Defense, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was founded in 2018. Um, you know, can you tell us a little more about how your efficient growth strategy has maybe changed over time, especially as you, know, you went through the boom years of 2020 to 2021, you know, how, is, how has that affected you and your own outlook and the way you manage the company changed in that time? Sure, cool. Uh, I was uh, brought up between the wars, like between like the crises. So it's like an actually an interesting question. Like before I answer, I just want to ask the crowd so I know like who's here in terms of like, so our advices would be relevant. Just like in, in sorry for that. In a, no. quick, in a quick show of hands, how many folks here are in companies that are between like one person to 100 people? Okay, 100 between 500, over 500. Okay, cool, that, that's helpful, wonderful. Um, so, when, when we started the company, uh, we did the unbelievable sin of being uh, bootstrapped. We were actually profitable uh, on, uh, on day one. And this is how we, we manage our company for, uh, for about a year or two. And then, uh, when I thought that I already uh, escaped the, 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 the wonderful velocity of the VC world um, that I was already in, like bef before, before Active Fence, I had another company called TapDog that was sold to an Israeli company called SimilarWeb. So I kind of like went through the mm -hmm. process of um, raising money, board, uh, returning money to investors, this whole thing that our industry works on. Um, and when we started Active Fence, we thought we were out of it. But then we saw how much damage we can actually cause with more, with, more, uh, with more funding, that we can really get to more customers faster, that we can do like more, that just like by investing in, in all kinds of resources, all of a sudden we can offer more, more stuff to the market and actually grow so much faster. So we had incredible efficiency in, in, in the beginning, and then we, we, we grew and grew and grew. And and again, like in 2021, uh, we raised our almost last round, like the, the one, a round of like about $100 million. Uh, we actually did like another round uh, two months ago uh, of, like of, of like about $25 million. But the difference in what we're actually showing, the, the specific metrics that we're focusing on, mm -hmm. it went all of a sudden from, okay, how fast can you grow to how efficient can you grow? Mm -hmm. It's like, what's your unit economy? It's like. Do you spend, um, how much do you spend on sales and marketing? How much do you spend on, uh, on, on COGS in our world? How much do you spend on R&D? What's the, uh, what's the share of R&D out of the total ARR? And those are questions that nobody asked, like uh, let's say 18 months ago. And, uh, and mm -hmm. so the landscape for companies like us, companies in round B plus, really changed. This is like a different game. They changed the rules of the game and just need to adjust and play the game as it is. Super interesting. And maybe a, a follow-up is, how did that change the culture within the company? And how did you have to help the company and your employees adapt to 
that type of questions at the, the VC and board level? Changed a lot of things. Uh, like I, I just spoke with Lital, our account manager, my manager uh, of AWS, and she asked me, I don't know if you have like a calm uh, team to, uh, to manage some of the things that we're doing together. I said, no. No way. <laughs> if we have, we should we should eliminate them. And and this is the this is this is the culture right now. It's like if you're not doing uh, something that is affecting one of the three KPIs that I care about, which is like our ARR, our our pipeline, and our burn ratio. So stop everything you do. Figure out how you're actually supporting those KPIs. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, well, we have a problem. Um, so it really changes our culture. Yeah, that, that, and that's often part of the hardest change, right, is the cultural change internally with your employees. So, um, well, Jonathan, I wanna, I wanna go to you next. Um, Riverside, as you mentioned earlier, you started it with your two brothers, uh, which I have like a million questions about. Um, I love my brother. I don't know that I could start a company with him. I needed some time away for a little while. Um, but maybe that's another panel or we can come back to it at the end. Um, sticking with the actual theme of today, um, you know, I think you were also bootstrapped um, early on for your first year. And so maybe you can also share some insights with us about um, how that, you know, early on built a culture within your company and you're thinking about this idea of efficient growth. Yeah, sure. So uh, when we started, we only had our bar mitzvah money, right? So we couldn't spend anything. <laughs> and we we're like, okay, we have this idea. What are we going to do now? So you're super cost aware, but you also, it's in the end, like I think what's really important, yes, it's about efficiency, efficiency, but it's also about growth, right? And it's, it's easier to optimize your cost structure. You can, you know, you can do all kinds of things but it's how do you grow as well efficiency. So I think in the beginning we were very much focused on like, okay, what are like scratchy ways how we're gonna grow this business with basically no money, right? And that just, in the end, it's just hard effort, ton of outreach, et cetera. And then as we started growing quickly, you know, we, we, we Zev was our first, the first investor into Riverside. Um, we raised money, but I think coming from that bootstrap background, we actually have had from day one, a really cost efficient mindset like, hey, we need to grow, but we need to grow in a, in a way that makes sense. And this was during the booms, right? Like it was when everybody was suddenly raising $100 million rounds, everybody was a unicorn, right? Money left and right. And in those times we were like, hey, no guys, at Riverside, we really think about how we spend, how we burn. We were tracking on what we call the burn multiple. Um, so I think what it actually enabled us to do is that, you know, now suddenly everybody's speaking about efficiency, but actually what we, at Riverside, it's nothing new for us. So we are really, weeping the benefits now, right? We're already in that mindset. We didn't need to fire anybody because the, the organization was built in such a sustainable way where, you know, it's really setting us up now to, to operate in a very successful manner where we are, you know, very cost efficient, but also I think equally important growing very fast. It's, uh, it's nostalgic for me to hear you talk about that because um, th there are some interesting parallels to Amazon um, in that uh, so I joined Amazon in 2008, which was very early on. It was super frugal. We were a retailer, so you know, razor thin margins in the industry, and uh, and we had you know, n as much as it was a big company, that even then there was no money to do anything. And uh, I was in marketing, and at the time, Jeff Bezos had um, had something he would always tell the marketing team, which is, spending money on marketing is for people who haven't built a great product. Uh, <laughs> and so it was very disheartening as a marketer. I was like, well, what's my job here to do? And, you know, we had to get very scrappy and really look super carefully at ROI for every business case, which is kind of that same environment you're talking about. And, you know, not dissimilar, things change. I think Amazon is one of the biggest global advertising spenders in the world now. Um, and so I'm curious for you as you thought about um, were there any key moments for you that, that kind of flipped along the way where you started to prioritize growth to a greater degree than you had before? Um, we always focused on growth first, right? Like it's, it, it, it's growth, but in an efficient matter. So there hasn't been like a flip point, but like, again, you need to invest in order to grow. You're not gonna grow magically. You need to build an R&D team. So yeah. I think just understanding what do I actually need? And understanding how much people can do, right? Like it's not, you don't need 10 engineers. No, maybe I need five engineers, maybe I need four, right? And it's like really, I think having small teams but going to the maximum rather than having like a really wide force because then you have all these overhead costs, right? And, and you see this, you get like a 
the bigger you go get, right? The, you get like the more inefficiencies, it gets harder to manage. So you need to invest very hard, right? Otherwise you're not gonna grow. Uh, and I think for us, to, to your point right around the product, like we, we are not, we are also really thinking about, and, and this is not for every company obviously, but it's like, okay, how can you use your, co your, your product as lever to grow, right? Product led growth. Um, and then how do you create loops within the product that initially it's gonna grow on its own and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and you have a flywheel, right? Okay, so every user, and if you think about Riverside, I'm recording, I'm gonna invite you. You're like, hey, what is Riverside? And then you're thinking about, okay, probably I also need to record something next time, I'm also gonna go to Riverside. So you get this internal flywheel in the product, right? So I would encourage every founder here to like really think about your product and can you bring, you know, can you build these internal growth loops in your product that's gonna basically help you grow in a very efficient manner so you don't need to go the, the marketing spend and million dollars in the beginning at least, right? Eventually, you know, you plateau, you need to go wider, and et cetera. Cool, yeah, and those metrics that are so key, like, you know, user retention, repeat usage, net revenue retention, makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, Dan, you've been silent long enough. Um, we, gotta, we gotta hear about Dig, so, um, so look, Dig, um, I think, you know, if I'm not mistaken, you've raised $45 million over two rounds and uh, first round 11 million, eight months later, uh, you landed another 34 million. Um, and so I think, I don't wanna exaggerate, but you know, probably safe to say you're in a high growth trajectory, maybe even hyper growth. Um, how do you think about managing that? And you obviously had you know, a lot of capital available to you at a very early stage, kind of as opposed to the other two founders we have here that were bootstrapped in the beginning. You know, how did you think about that and deploy your own strategies maybe differently or not as a result of that? So first off, it's a great question. Um, <coughs> I'm actually kind of super envious of kind of bootstrap and kind <laughs> of going <laughs> properly and kind of thinking about this smart. We didn't. Um, I would say that in cybersecurity specifically, I always say that cybersecurity acts like an accordion. Okay, so why does it act like an accordion? Because typically when you have a new category, then you're gonna have many, 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 many competitors. So the accordion kind of expands. And then you're gonna have market consolidation. Some people, I mean, some companies will actually die and then you're gonna like remain with two or three uh, market leaders. And then maybe kind of one company will actually become a big company that will start expanding to other locations as well. So um, when you understand that market behavior, uh, that you're gonna have multiple competitors, that you're gonna have kind of a super high growth category, and if you specifically landed on that high growth category in cybersecurity, then you have to grow like a maniac. Um, and this mm -hmm. is something that we basically understood very, very early on. When we started the company, it was October of 2021, um, kind of in the midst of kind of the big hype, everyone was raising $15 million seed rounds. We also, big, uh, we also had kind of a big seed round. But I think that in cybersecurity, you need to have quite a bit more capital when you start, in general. I think that uh, the maturity that organizations expect when you come to them with a cybersecurity product is much higher. Um, and I think that you need to build in stuff that no one kind of thinks about in other spaces like single sign-on and kind of RBAC and kind of multiple different types of pieces out mm -hmm. there. So uh, the actual maturity level when you come to an enterprise is higher, but the deal sizes are bigger. So we know that we need limited number of deals, but each deal is $200,000. So you don't need kind of a lot of deals to essentially hit your metrics. Now I think that typically organizations or startup founders need to also understand how are they getting measured across the markets and what is expected from them. I think that the golden number in cybersecurity is always first year half a million dollars ARR, second year three million dollars ARR, third year 10. Okay, that's kind of the basic, basic numbers. And if you're below that, then you're not considered a very good by company. And if you're above that, then you're considered fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you constantly need to think about that kind of growth trajectory, but also understanding that in cybersecurity, basically winners, winners of a specific category will get a lot of the spoils. I think we see that today with Wiz. Wiz is probably 10 times larger than, uh, than Orca or 15 times larger than Orca because they won that specific category, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we started building DIG, we understood that we're operating in a category like this one and we'll need to grow in this specific manner. So I think on average today, we grow three or four employees every month. Uh, we're still in that kind of growth trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's really hard, right? Because um, 
you constantly try to kind of onboard a lot of people at the same time. You need to have kind of super well-defined mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And because we understood that very early, I think the first thing that I ever built uh, at DIG when we kind of started hiring was kind of the thesis paper of why we actually created the actual company, a recording of me talking about the actual company, a demo flow of how do we do this, and we do this, I think every two months, I, we record us kind of how do we talk about this, because every month we have eight new people essentially joining the company. Mm -hmm. So how do you constantly kind of think about onboarding people efficiently? And in addition, I think um, a lot of people disregard this early on, but bringing in someone that knows how to handle finances when you kind of raise a big seed round, invaluable. I mean, I brought in a CFO, he was my third hire, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. And he saves us hundreds of thousands of dollars um, every quarter. So people that know and understand how to operate money um, and how to kind of manage every single place that you spend money and you burn like a maniac um, is is super, super important. And I always say that if you already kind of did your first million dollars in sales, also bring in a, ver also bring in like a RevOps person. I think that building those processes properly, measuring how each salesperson is efficient or not, how, do you, how are you spending on marketing? I think those are kind of super efficient as well. And I'm gonna give you a tip that, that like Shlomo Kramer gave me and he said, I will never spend any marketing dollar if I know if I don't know in advance how I'm going to measure it. Uh, mm. And I think that's super important. Um, and I kind of took that to heart very early, early on. And uh, this is kind of a key metric that we always measure, ROI and any marketing dollars spent and how we're going to measure it before we actually take on an event or advertising or anything like that. Super interesting. I mean, uh, maybe, you know, Noam, Jonathan, any of that resonate with you or you want to add how it, uh, how it reflects or maybe not um, in either of your companies? The whole thing uh, about, and again, it's, it's, I think it's like very different companies that uh, you guys have started in 2021, and uh, and it's like a different market. Also, it's like we're like in a fairly, it's not a new market, but there's not a lot of competitors, so we don't need to spend spend a lot on marketing. But uh, the whole thing about ROI on a, every dollar that you, that you're spending. That's super difficult, but it's also really changing the way the company is operating. It's, uh, so for example, revenue ops, um, like super important. Think about like marketing ops. Like you, 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 you're doing an event, okay? It's like people scan your badge here. The reason they're scanning your badge is because they want to measure the ROI on your presence here. Like this is like an AWS event. Uh, how is this going to be correlated <coughs> with the spend on AWS now or in two years from now or the lifetime value of existing customers? But this whole process, this is not that trivial for many people that grew up in marketing departments uh, in, let's say, the last five, six years. You know everything about it. You started in, 20, 20, in 2008 and you, you know, from a frugal uh, <laughs> uh, uh, culture, but there's a lot of companies that, that that's not their thing. Yeah. It's like, what's also the ROI on every new HR hire? What's the new ROI on, on, on every, on like the marginal ROI that, that you're making? And this is such uh, a massive struggle for companies today to make sure that you're, you're growing because it's kind of like we can't be righteous. Uh, and, um, and, and like Dan, Dan said it v like very well, the, the, the sentiment kind of like they're saying, hey, grow but in a healthy way. But, well, you still need to grow like crazy, but you need to be way more efficient. So it's like the, the game is like twice as hard. So everything uh, eventually is trickling down to, uh, to like the mid-management also. Like you need to do more with less and like significantly less. Mm -hmm. And this, like in my opinion, in those years, uh, we're actually creating like a wonderful generation of operators uh, and mm -hmm. executives that are actually thinking like a bootstrap company, but they're operating in a, in a high grow, growth environment. It's like a, mut a wonderful mutation. Uh, and in five years from now, in 10 years from now, we'll start to see the companies that will come from that generation. But right now, yeah, it's, it's super challenging. I agree. I think what I would add as well, what I've seen many founders struggle with is like, okay, how do you measure ROI, right? And then you get to these like metrics, like, okay, cock over LTV. <laughs> and you're trying to understand like, okay, but w w what is the LTV, right? The lifetime value of my customer. And you're like a one-year-old startup. So it's like, <laughs> try, try projecting your churn on churn rate on that customer or your expansion on that customer. So I think one thing for us, and, and again, I think, you know, for, for founders, pr 
in, in this room could be useful is how we, we tried, okay, we want like a metric that's like a, as unbiased as possible and just gives like a health indicator to like, are we, what, what's efficient growth in it, right? So it's the burn multiple, which in essence looks, okay, what's my net burn, right, on a month? So how much money am I spending? So let's do an example. I, I burned $1 million and I grew with a half a million dollars, right? And I'm doing one divided by half is two, which means for every $1, for every $2 I spent, I get $1 back. And I think in nowadays markets, right, like if you're spending $2 to get $1, it's probably not so good. So with this metric, you don't need to really make any assumption on like how it's gonna churn. You're just literally looking what are in the end of the, end, end of the month, right? How much money did I add? How much money did I burn? And then you can start optimizing, right, where you wanna probably be depending on the stage, et cetera, where you are, you know, in the idea world, right, $1 for $1, maybe even lower, right? But I think it's a very good way to start thinking about your burn versus growth and, and not, not kid yourself because I've seen people have like the most crazy LTV and they're like, oh, this is fine, I have a good ROI. Ah, probably not so much. So I think that's, that's I think the only thing I would add here on when you're thinking through, through ROI. Yeah, I think it's a great tip. You know, it's, hey, if you're a five-year-old company, you're gonna have a sophisticated set of metrics, you're gonna understand your customers well. If you're brand new, you're not but you shouldn't let that stop you from measuring something because measuring something is gonna be better than measuring nothing and then you can get more sophisticated as you go. I think it's, it's great advice. Um, maybe one more before we move on. You know, Dan, you talked about your early journey. I gotta ask, you know, any ways that maybe AWS helped you um, in that uh, early journey? I think that in markets like ours, AWS is a key partner. Um, I think that's I mean, I think we all know that AWS is probably the like, largest cloud in the world. Most of our customers are operating on AWS as their main clouds. And first off, if you don't know, AWS has a marketplace. That marketplace essentially allows enterprises to pay uh, to other vendors like us through that marketplace. And building those kind of relationships very, very early on with your main clouds of, of your customers is key, right? Customers usually kind of, um, they essentially commit a specific portion of money to their main cloud vendor. They want to get a discount, right? Um, so they'll say, I'm committing $10 million this year to essentially spend on AWS. That means that now they can pay every single vendor that, that, that essentially supports um, AWS Marketplace through that commitment. So not only they essentially got a discount, but they can also um, pay through that discount as well. Now. For a company like us, this is magic, right? Because you know that they have money to spend. You know that they need to spend it this year, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're not essentially creating a new budget line item out of that specific thing. So a lot of companies during end of year usually, they need to spend that money that, uh, that they haven't spent before. Or they essentially pull everything, so essentially they'll have um, a single vendor. Procurement in large enterprises is hell. I don't know if you've ever done it. <laughs> um, it might take, three, six, nine months to essentially go through actual procurements. And sometimes if it's a financial, you need to go through kind of, where does each piece of dollar essentially come into the company? Do you have Russian money? Do you have Chinese money? There's a lot of kind of uh, process through that. And doing that through the marketplace is um, key, right? So we built that relationship kind of very early on. Uh, do we have great partners here? Um, and we'll continue to essentially invest there. I see this as a partnership. And today when we come into enterprise deals, we leverage that partnership. We work with the account managers in those specific deals to essentially help us grow. So I think that's super influential for us. Awesome, well, on our end, we're happy to lean in. And yeah, as Dan said, like, there's actual budgets out there you can tap into through this mechanism and removes a lot of friction so that you're really just able to sell the, sell the product. Um, good, well, we're gonna move, uh, move on. So I think this is, uh, this is for you, Gnome. So, uh, We've talked a lot about the efficiency side of the, the quest for growth. I do want to make sure we talk about the growth side of it. Um, lots of entrepreneurs, people at companies looking for, you know, innovative, innovative new ways to grow. Um, and I think, you know, there's a story here from Active Fence, um, also given that um, there's some unique market conditions out there. You know, it's headwinds and depressed valuations for some companies that can be an opportunity for others. And so, how do you think about that? So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of creative ways to grow in this market. Uh, one of them uh, is also through M&A. 
this climate creates a lot of opportunities. Some companies are more successful than others. Some some companies have like different investors than others, and and the situation creates a lot of a lot of opportunities and a lot of consolidation right now. So so we recently acquired uh, a UK based company uh, with with a terrific team, a terrific team. And that usually in, in smaller startups, you see, you see folks that are most suitable to this environment. It's like the, the people who, at least like in, in, our, in our company, but I think it's like in, in many other companies who are most successful are folks that can do several things in one. Uh, here in, in, in this room, like I saw Yuri from uh, our, our, uh, our CISO, hey. Uh, he's <laughs> an example of someone who we, we hired him to one job. And then five minutes after he was, he was hired, we asked him, hey, we need you to do something completely different on top of what you do. Uh, <laughs> remember that fun period? Uh, and, and, and those are exactly the type of folks that are successful in, in these types of environments. And so actually when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're bringing more people from different cultures to your team that, that answer those criteria, uh, you actually can, can be more successful. But you know, I'm, I'm very curious also about AWS. Like, how do you do that? Because, like, I don't know if you read, they grew, like, 17% last quarter. Uh, and you're the most frugal company in the world. So how's that working for you? Yeah, I think there's a few, few I'll, give you, I'll give you two things. So um, one of the things is, is on direct growth. The other is about um, employee fungibility. So look, I think in AWS, and specifically with startup, which I can talk about, you know, most precisely, um, for us, it's about placing bets over time that have different maturity horizons. So we're doing things today that can help, you know, our customers be successful tomorrow. You know, maybe it's helping Dan close an enterprise deal um, that's ultimately going to be great for his business. You know, it'll increase AWS consumption, you know, within a matter of days. Um, and that's a great win-win. At the same time, um, myself, the team here, you know, we're also working with really early stage startups, you know, just founded, maybe even haven't deployed an MVP or found product market fit. You know, it's unlikely that they're going to be a material consumer of AWS anytime in the near term, but we're placing those bets, leaning in, providing resources, credits, technical assistance, things like our acceleration programs, um, access to other markets and setting them up for future success, um, knowing that, hey, two, three years down the line, if they execute on the product vision we believe in, and if that extra support from AWS helps them go a little bit faster, they'll be a meaningful customer for us. And so I think that's really important advice is, you know, as you think about growth, don't put all your eggs in one basket and think about you know, the maturity timeline of the different initiatives that you're running within your company. Um, and then the second one's more of an anecdote because you mentioned the story of URI. Um, we have a lot of people that double hat um, in AWS as well. And um, there's a common phenomenon which my team you know, sitting in the front rows can probably recognize, which is the gift of any time you change jobs in the company is you usually get to do both jobs for about six months or a year. And so that's another good way um, to build some different skills uh, in the organization. You see, we, we grew our panel and uh, without adding more cost. Yeah, so exactly. Demonstrating there, efficiency. There you go. I asked for innovative growth strategies and I got them. Um, fantastic. All right, we'll go back to the, uh, the other end with, uh, with Jonathan. So look, um, given that you initially had this cost aware state of mind, I assume you were looking at the economics in every part of your business. Um, did AWS play a role at all in, in how it helped you get off the ground and, and start to scale while keeping an eye on those things? Yeah, so definitely. So we're, you know, we're speaking about cost optimization, being cost aware, but the truth is that our AWS was a, it was a complete nightmare. We were completely <laughs> unoptimized. And AWS actually found us, hey, they're like, hey, guys, what are you doing? We're like paying on credit card, $100,000 a month. And they're like, this is not no, no negotiated pricing, nothing. And I think what was actually really cool about AWS was that you found us. It took you guys a while because we were still in a Dutch entity, but eventually the Israeli entity found us. And they started speaking to us like, look, your, your, your arc, and we, we kind of, the way we looked at it in the beginning was a bit naive, I think. It's like, okay, we're growing really quickly, so this is the price you pay with AWS, right? We were a bit naive in it, we're not really thinking about, and on that side, I'm like, okay, how do you think about our architecture? Um, mm -hmm. and, and what AWS did is that they found us, they started speaking with us, right? Created awareness with us. It was back then Yotam, later it's Aner and Jonathan. 
Um, and and I think what they've done is that you know they made us work like, look, guys, you're you're not you're completely unoptimized in your infrastructure, right? And through that the process, we basically did a, a whole um, revamp of the, you know wh what what storage tiers do you use, right? Do you deep archive? Do you delete? And those kind of questions um, to eventually you know cut our bill in half to provide the exact same service, right? We didn't have to have there was like no there was no downside. It was just literally optimization. And I think ADL, AWS could have, you know, looked the other way, mm -hmm. say like, oh, this is great. These guys are just spending like crazy, growing. We don't care. Great. Let them pay on their credit card. And instead, you know, they, I think they took the long-term approach of, of saying like, look, these guys are clearly onto something. They're wasting money. We should tell them. And then, you know, long-term grow with them uh, as, as, as they continue to grow. So I think they've been really instrumental on, on, on that side. And obviously... It's really important more in this in this in this environment, right? It's what's your gross margin, and AWS is is obviously a huge part of that gross margin. So, mm -hmm. yeah, a great partner. Cool, glad to hear that. And uh, you would be shocked to hear how many customers, maybe not, um, how many customers we went out to in a similar way proactively um, in 2020, in 2021, and we said, hey, we we think you can like save some money on your bill and you know reinvest it in the, and they said, we don't want to talk to you. We're good, nothing matter. And suddenly those phone calls are all coming back right now in the current climate. So, you know, priorities can change and, and you know, we're here. Um, Cause as you, I think said very well, um, we want to build a long-term business. Um, and that only works if you've got a viable product operating at the margins that are best for you, that you can reinvest. Um, and that's something that I think we've, we've proved out over time. Um, Good, so Dan, um, speaking of efficiency, I'm curious, and cloud, um, I'm curious to you know, cast our minds a bit into the future. You know, do you have any thoughts on your vision of you know, how cloud, and you obviously look at it from a security perspective, but maybe even overall, um, is gonna unfold over the next three, four, five years? Yeah, so um, I always say to CISOs, um, chief information security officers, that multi-cloud is inevitable. And um, it's not by choice. I don't think companies want to be multi-cloud. I think it's a, it's a hassle. It's a hassle. You need to manage kind of different infrastructure across different kind of environments. You need to have kind of different skill sets. But I actually think it's inevitable because large enterprises mostly grow through um, M&A, inorganic opportunities. And that essentially means that if a 5,000 employee company or a 10,000 employee company will not, will not buy a 500 employee company that runs on a different cloud, then by nature now you had AWS and now you have Azure. Mm -hmm. Now are you going to spend this year migrating that company without getting any benefit into that other cloud? Definitely not. Okay, so now you're running on two clouds. And then you're going to buy another company. They're going to run on a third cloud or a fourth cloud. So I think that multi-cloud by nature is inevitable. Um, and I think that organizations need to understand how do we adapt to that. I think that this is the year of cost. We already see this from, from um, companies. As a security organization, I never had to talk um, about cost optimization. Cost optimization has kind of went into every single piece of the organization today. CISOs talk to me, how do you help me cut down costs? This was never a conversation that I used to have two, three, four years ago. Um, as Microsoft or Google or now a dig. So, I think this multi-cloud and efficiency, I think, is kind of a big topic that a lot of organizations are talking about, and I think anyone that can help there is going to be very successful. Excellent. And I like how you positioned it, which is, you know, multi-cloud is due to acquisition, not due to people willingly embracing it. So I think that's an important point I'll highlight. No. <laughs> it's a hassle. It is. it is a hassle, isn't it? I think that's a good, good framing. Well, I can see the, the time is, um, is unfortunate. It's very bright red and aggressive in terms <laughs> of uh, our time being up. So I think we'll, we'll wrap it there. Look, um, thank you all um, for the fantastic insights. Um, I think they really highlight the agility and adaptability that you see, um, particularly in startups out of the Israeli ecosystem, and it is no doubt in my mind one of the reasons that so many phenomenal global successes, like the three companies that you represent and have founded here today, have come from this ecosystem. So thank you, and a quick plug that next up, we have a excellent session starting in 15 minutes. Um, on mistakes founders make, followed by the investor session, which I mentioned at the beginning. So make sure not to miss those. And please join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists.
Thank you.